So to further set the scene this morning, I just want to start by um, sharing the wise words of Benjamin Franklin. Um, and no, no offence to you here, uh, Michael, but um, he stated, beware of the young doctor and the old barber. But Benjamin Franklin also noted that there are more old drunkards than old doctors. I selected these quotes this morning because I think they nicely capture an essential tension in the medical workforce. We need new blood coming in, but we also need a system that supports and encourages the retention of our older, more experienced doctors, because without them we wouldn't have their experience, their knowledge and the essential training that they provide. Most importantly, however, I think we need a system that supports the needs of both, and we need to strike a balance. Now, as Hein has reiterated quite nicely this morning, we are aware that there is a fair amount of discontent within the senior medical workforce. Uh, we know that a lot of doctors are being forced to work through illness. We know that a high proportion are currently suffering from burnout. We also know that from data from the Medical Council that while the absolute number of medical specialists is slightly increasing year on year, we also know that in proportionate terms New Zealand remains uh, one of the worst performing countries in terms of number of specialists per head of the population. Now as my colleague Lyndon has outlined um, in his research brief in your packs, we do have increasing numbers of women entering the medical workforce and this is great. Uh, and if these two who are embarking upon their careers in the NHS in the UK follow international trends, then they may choose to work fewer hours than their male uh, counterparts and they may have more part-time um, roles to take. We also know, of course, that we have a high proportion of uh, senior medical specialists who are aged 55 and above, and so for many of these people, retirement is looming ahead. So combined with these demographic factors, we also have the allure of the shiny private sector, and if anything is to be believed, um, if, if you work in the private sector, you'll be happy and smiling just like these people are. But interestingly, we did know from the burnout research that those specialists who did have more public work commitment, uh, sorry, private work commitment in a week, they did actually have a slightly lower burnout score. So there are some tensions there between the allure of the private sector. And of course we know that uh, there are always better paid jobs and more interesting experiences to be had if you go overseas. So all of these factors combined are shaping our public medical workforce in New Zealand. And as a consequence, we think it's really important to know how things may change in the future and what factors may shape these intentions. So the research that I'm outlining today is still reasonably preliminary, um, but it was based on three key, key aims. And the first one here was to assess rates of intentions to leave or to change your level of involvement in the DHB-based medical workforce. Now we defined future work intentions to include changes that may be sought in the course of your work but may not actually happen or may not actually be possible. For example, um, it might be nice if you could all drop your after hours on-call commitments but then that would create a whole host of problems. But nevertheless, we were interested in people's intentions. What would they like to happen in the future? Uh, most importantly, we also sought to get a feeling as to what the push and pull factors are. Um, as Ian and Jimmy started out by saying, we, um, we probably can't all have personal misuses, but what type of things would shape uh, an actor's incentives and disincentives to continue on in the medical workforce? And as always, we're trying to look at patterns. Are there associations between various intentions to leave and core demographic factors? But other things as well, such as job satisfaction, whether or not you were trained in New Zealand, and your medical specialty. So the design of our study um, focused on three possible scenarios. Now importantly, these scenarios are not mutually exclusive. But to put some kind of rigour into our survey, we had to kind of treat them as if they were mutually exclusive. So the first question that we posed is how likely are you to consider leaving 
medicine entirely over the next five years. And for all those who selected that they were either likely or extremely likely to leave, we siphoned them off and put them to the end of the survey so that we weren't double counting people who were um, considering leaving. So as you'll see as I go through the slides, there is a steadily decreasing total pool of people. The second scenario, uh, we were asking people the likelihood of them remaining in DHB-based employment over the next five years. So this was to capture people who may like to stay in New Zealand, who may wish to continue practicing medicine, but may wish to do so perhaps in a different setting to a, uh, a DHB. And finally, we asked people to consider the likelihood of leaving New Zealand permanently to go overseas. Uh, again, looking to see if we could capture people who are looking for other opportunities, or perhaps some of our international medical graduates who may be considering returning home. Um, of the remaining pool, those who weren't signalling an intention to leave, we looked at how they might like to change their FTE, um, whether they'd like to increase, decrease, or keep it the same, and similarly how they would like to change their on-call or shift work commitments. And again, as I have emphasised here, it's how they might like to. It might not actually happen. So this leads me on to uh, just a brief note about some of the limitations of this approach. It is, of course, a prospective study. We're asking people to look forward five years and think about what they might like to do. And with any kind of prospective study where we're looking at intentions, we have to be aware that what people may intend to do at this point in time may not actually happen. Circumstances may change. But I think it's also important to state that this can go either way. Uh, and on that note, there is some research to suggest that intentions can be a very strong predictor. Um, and we also know as well that looking at the demographic makeup of a medical workforce, as well as the level of job satisfaction, also act as key um, sort of predictive events as to what's going to happen in the years to come. So on, on the advantages of this approach, nevertheless, what this research does give us is an understanding as to who may be at risk of leaving the, the medical workforce, and again, understanding these reasons why. And in turn, we're hoping that this will help us develop some interventional strategies and again inform our um, industrial work in particular. So, to the core findings, um, we had an excellent response rate to the survey. We had 63% response rate. And as a consequence, the data that we gained was extremely detailed, um, and we think it's pretty robust. We actually had 2,424 responses, but uh, this graph is based on those who left data pertaining to their gender and age groups. So as you can see here, we have a beautiful, almost perfect um, bell-shaped curve with a slight dip off in that 50 to 54-year-old age group. We can see that 36% are aged 55 and above, and 7% are actually aged uh, 65 and over. You can also see there the different kind of peaks for those uh, women in the workforce as opposed to men, reflecting um, the growing feminisation, and indeed, for those aged between 30 and 39, there were more women than men. Uh, and quite reassuringly, this graph very, very closely matches the projections from the Ministry of Health that Emmanuel Joe is working on, and it's a very, very close match for the Medical Council um, workforce data too. So it's always reassuring to find that your data is a, is a close match. And just to give you a snapshot of what we found, um, of those who responded to the survey, 572 individuals signalled uh, a likelihood or an extreme likelihood of leaving in the next five years. And this is broken down into the following three segments, which I'll go, to, uh, go into in a bit more detail. 387 were considering leaving medicine entirely, a, a much lower number planning on uh, leaving DHB-based employment, and only 77 who were considering going overseas. So this is around about 24% of the senior medical workforce who responded to the survey. So just to go into these in a little bit more detail, 16.2%, um, that 500 odd amounts to 16.2%, suggested that they were extremely likely or likely to leave, and a further 10% who were signalling that they were unsure. And I think that's quite important because, again, as we know, intentions can change over time. So we may well see that 16.2% reduce, but we may also see it increase. 
Again, a far uh, lower percentage considering uh, not staying on in some form of DHB-based employment. And the wording of this question was a deliberate inverse wording, so that you had to signal you were unlikely or extremely unlikely to stay in the DHB. Um, and again, another 11.6% who are sitting on the fence. A much lower proportion considering uh, going over new, uh, overseas permanently, leaving New Zealand. But again, a reasonably high proportion who are unsure, 12% in that case. Now, there were, there were a whole number of significant correlations between intentions to leave and the various variables and demographic factors, but due to time constraints, I'm not going to go into that in great detail today, other than to say um, there was a clear correlation with age, as I'll go into shortly. Uh, there were significant variations according to specialty, and at least for those who were considering leaving medicine entirely, there was a significant variation by DHB. So if we look at the gender profile, this graph shows uh, all the scenarios of intentions to leave cut by age and gender, and each line represents the percentage of each men and women in each age group who are considering uh, leaving. And as you might expect, the, the proportion of those leaving significantly increases as they move up the age profile. So for all women aged 70 or over who responded to the survey, uh, they were all signalling an intention to leave in the next five years. Interestingly though, um, and again we do know that specialists do often stay on well beyond what we might deem normal retirement age, only 80% of men who responded to the survey aged 70 and above were signalling an intention to leave. Um, so again we're still kind of drilling down into the data but um, that graph was as we might expect. Uh, no real surprises, although there was a slight blip in that 35 to 39 year old age group with women um, having a higher intention to leave than their male counterparts. Now as I mentioned there were some variations by DHB, um, this was only significant for those who were intending to leave medicine entirely, but you can see here for some of our smaller DHBs such as Wairarapa, um, and note the x-axis is actually only going up to 70%, we had um, nearly 60% of those who responded to the survey were signalling an intention to leave. And when I drilled down into the data, we have 27 members at the Wairarapa and 21 of those responded. So that's actually a pretty high uh, coverage. So again, a reasonably worrying um, potential scenario for the Wairarapa and some of our other smaller DHBs. And the colour coding gives you the different types of scenarios uh, that they might leave. So what I think you can see here is a clear majority um, considering leaving medicine entirely, but I think that also reflects the, the demographic profile of the medical workforce. Now, when we cut it by, uh, by specialty, um, quite an interesting picture arises. So note again that the x-axis is only going up to 50% here, just to give you a bit of clarity. Now this graph just shows the specialties for which we had 25 respondents or more. Um, and if your specialty isn't up there, it may be on the following graph, or it may be that nobody was signalling an intention to leave. So here we can see that uh, over a third of those in rheumatology, endocrinology and ONG were considering leaving in the next five years. And just to kind of contextualise that percentage, uh, we had 25 respondents for rheumatology and endocrinology and 99 respondents for ONG. So that corresponds to around about nine in the first two specialties and 33 for obstetrics and gynaecology considering leaving in the next five years. For the smaller subspecialties, for those for which we received 25 responses or less, um, the picture was even more stark. Uh, again, this x-axis is going up to 100% now. Now, as you can probably see, some of these subspecialties are very small, and as a consequence, the data may be skewed because of that. But nevertheless, we know that in, for example, paediatric palliative care, nuclear medicine and forensic pathology, we have a very small, um, very low numbers in those subspecialties. So if one or two people are planning on leaving, as these results suggest, that may amount to you know, over a quarter of the existing workforce. So there can be some, um, there may be some significant issues with some of the smaller subspecialties in the years to come. So 
So just to go into some of the qualitative data, um, a key part of this research was asking people uh, what are the main reasons that are encouraging you to consider leaving. Um, so for those who are considering leaving medicine entirely, clear majority uh, put it down to their age. Um, they reached what they deemed to be an appropriate retirement age or they were feeling too old to continue practicing. But second to that, of course, is feeling um, exhausted and burnt out and not feeling able to continue because of the pressure of work. So that was quite an interesting finding. Um, and I'll just read you a couple of quotes from some of the respondents, just to give you a flavour for this. So one respondent noted that the main reason they're considering leaving is because of their increasing age. I have a desire to finish work while my reputation is intact. I have a loss of confidence in staying up to date. The long post-acute ward rounds are becoming more physically and emotionally demanding, and I have a desire to commence retirement in good health and fitness. Another respondent noted, they feel there is a lack of respect and will for employers to retain older part-time practitioners. They feel there is little appreciation from managers for the skills older practitioners bring to this job, and some members of the department view old fogies as inferior. For those considering leaving DHB-based employment, it wasn't all that surprising to see that the key reason cited here was feeling disillusioned with DHB management and the New Zealand public health system. And I should note that this was an open text box which I then coded according to emergent themes. I didn't give them reasons, this was just what was emerging out of the data. And closely aligned to that was this feeling of low morale, poor job satisfaction and the inability to make changes. So some of the quotes here, um, the psychiatrist noted, I feel undervalued and taken for granted. There is a constant drive for more for less, which is incredibly draining. We are asked to make savings when in psychiatry, we truly believe we require more resources, not less. Rates of methamphetamine and general referrals to mental health are increasing. We believe deprivation is increasing in our DHB. Why stick it out when I can earn more and work less in private practice? My only concern is I will truly miss working in a team and teaching medical students, junior doctors and allied staff. And another person noted, management are uncompromising and they don't listen. My department is so understaffed, everybody is under pressure. I feel powerless to change this as there is no unity in my department. I find it difficult to turn work off because I have so much work left after every working day. I have plenty of other options in the private sector. So a lot of similar, similar type comments to those which I was reading in the burnout survey as well, but it's, um, it is quite worrying. Now for those considering leaving New Zealand, I was interested to note that the key driver here was uh, a desire for better remuneration, as well as um, the uh, career opportunities that can be found overseas. So high proportion um, referencing these themes. And just briefly, one, one comment in this regard, they said, poor DHB management and lack of facilities available to provide comprehensive patient care is driving me overseas, and it's the poor remuneration for the services provided. So we also asked people, um, a bit like as the improvisers did, what would they change and what would induce them to stay if they could change it. Unfortunately, for those leaving medicine entirely, um, a big proportion said, well, nothing would induce me to stay. And I suspect this is, again, a reflection of the age. Um, but one, one person noted, there's absolutely nothing that would induce me to stay. Why would I work like I do when I can sell real estate with no qualifications for triple plus the money? This country is totally screwed. <laughs> um, Perhaps less vehement, uh, one person noted that there's not really anything that would induce me to stay. I'll do my bit till I'm 65, provided I remain fit and up to the mark. There is a time for every purpose. Again, I think it's interesting. We can see a clear uh, emphasis on, um, apart from those uh, who are past it, this provision of um, flexible working hours, part-time work opportunities, and also this emphasis on not having to do call and uh, shift work in evenings. So these are, these are very significant factors. Now for the other scenarios, um, 
This one really struck me. For those considering leaving DHB employment, one of the key factors that would consider them to change their mind is being able to take leave. Now that's, that's huge. Um, I mean, this came out very strongly in the presenteeism research that um, a lot of people don't feel able to take sick leave, especially short-term sick leave, but this also captures annual leave too. And second to that, if they could improve management culture and have less bureaucracy, they would reconsider. Some quotes here, um, this one respondent noted, I would stay if I had managers who listen to and respect clinicians, actually being able to achieve change without having to be difficult. A respectable job sizing offer, a decrease in clinical workload without then asked to, be do, to do more to meet FSA targets when I already work 15 to 20 hours extra per week. And finally, um, again, perhaps the flip side, the reason driving people overseas, they feel that there needs to be better remuneration. But I think in this sense, it's actually better remuneration for the services rendered. So this person noted, um, if I had remuneration commensurate with the work I actually do and commensurate with what I can actually obtain in my home country. And another person noted, if I felt more secure about my retirement savings, I would stay in New Zealand. It took many years to pay off the student loan, then time out to have children has meant I do not have enough saved for my future. So remuneration is an issue for many. Um, so we're nearly there, just wrapping up. Um, and the, la the last section was asking people how they might like to change their FTE and on call. Now over half said that they wouldn't like to change it at all, they were um, happy to keep it as it was, but nearly 40% signalled that they would like to decrease their FTE, uh, only 7% said that they would want to increase. And again looking at people's views on their on-call commitments, uh, again a clear majority said that they wouldn't like to change it at all, but nearly 30% suggested that if they had a choice, they would really like to reduce their after hours core or shift work components. And nearly 8% suggested that they'd like to drop it entirely. Only 2% suggested that they'd actually like to increase this component of their work. So, worst case scenario. Well, for many of us at the current time, it's probably the uh, future of a Trumpageddon, um, certainly weighing heavy on our minds, but bring it back down to the medical workforce, what we see here, and again this is a potential, 24% of those who responded to the survey may leave over the next five years for a variety of reasons. Of the remaining 76%, 40% would like to decrease their FTE and may end up doing so, 30% would like to decrease their call or shift work, and 8% would like to drop their call entirely. Now, Lyndon can perhaps speak to this a bit better because he's been looking into this, but the exit rate does align with Ministry of Health data, but it does appear that the exit rates suggested in this survey are slightly higher and, than what we've seen reported in the previous five years. So why is this? Well, I think here we can see a clear uh, impact of the ageing medical workforce, but secondly, we can really see the impact of, of low job satisfaction explicitly shaping people's intentions. Now we know from previous research that having a low job satisfaction is a, is a really key predictor as to what people may end up doing. And in all the three scenarios, those who were scored as having very poor job satisfaction had a far higher likelihood of leaving than those who didn't. In the comments we can see this constant reiteration of uh, feeling disenfranchised, fed up with the culture in the DHBs, particularly as a consequence of management. Um, but also some interesting comments around remuneration and again the impact of workloads. The data does suggest that for some of the smaller DHBs they may feel a bigger impact than those that are larger and have more of a buffer and similarly some of the smaller subspecialties may have critical shortages uh, if other things don't change. So aside from discovering the elixir of life, um, I think some of the key things that could be changed is this provision of more flexible working hours. I know that's something that our industrial team are working on, especially with the on-call roster for older um, doctors. But again, this emphasis on being able to take your leave um, and have this improvements to DHB culture. I put the point here about better remuneration. I think the key thing here is actually having the work captured or having the pay that you receive actually accurate, accurately reflecting the work that you do. 
so many people seem to work above and beyond their, actually, their actual contracted FTE, and I think for many people that's wearing thin. And again, um, more opportunities in the New Zealand context. So I'll leave it there. Um, I just, I'd like to acknowledge all of those who did participate in this research, as well as Chris, who uh, does all the statistics work, and Lyndon and Murray, who assisted with the design of the survey. So I'll open it up to questions. Thank you. Thank you.